My name is Michael Martinek, Director of Marketing for Keystone Dental, and I'd like to welcome you back to another Keystone Dental Group Vanguard webinar. Over these last few weeks, it has been my pleasure to share with you our mutual goal of ongoing learning. And to help us continue on our journey, we have Dr. Nuit Bittner in today's webinar, where she will concentrate on restorative treatment guidelines to achieve aesthetic results in implant dentistry. Dr. Bittner will also show solutions to improve the aesthetic outcome, as well as guidelines to achieve a more predictable result. In addition, evidence-based outcomes reported in the latest literature evaluating pink implants and pink abutments will be discussed. The title for today, Aesthetics in Implant Dentistry Through Restorative Solutions. Dr. Bittner received her dental degree in Caracas, Venezuela at the Central University of Venezuela and completed a master program in prosthodontics at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine. She is a diplomat of the American College of Prosthodontics, an associate professor of clinical dentistry for the Division of Prosthodontics, and program director for the postdoctoral prosthodontics program at Columbia University. She is active in multiple professional organizations and has received a regional award from the American College of Prosthodontics Northeast Section for her research, where she has performed multiple clinical and in vitro research projects. She has authored several scientific papers and has lectured internationally in both English and Spanish. And with this, it is my pleasure to give a warm welcome to Dr. Nuri Bittner. Thank you so much, Michael, for the introduction. And I also want to thank the opportunity to Keystone Dental for inviting me to, to lecture for everybody. And moreover, I want to thank all of you to, for joining me. Um, I hope you're staying safe and you're staying well. One good thing, I guess, from all of this is that it's allowing us to connect from many different parts of the world. So here I am from New York and I am able to talk from my living room to everybody out there. So thank you for joining. And I want to share with you some of the things that we can do as restorative dentists to get some aesthetics in implant dentistry. So when we talk about implant aesthetics, we have different aspects that uh, we, different questions that we can answer. We have the, why are we doing, why is it so important to have implant aesthetics? How we can get it? And what materials we can use to get implant aesthetics? So let's start with the why. What really re makes a restoration an aesthetic restoration? And there is a big component about aesthetics that is very subjective. For example, this case, right? Some of our patients are gonna make demands of things that look aesthetic for them, like this specific patient wanted to have blue crowns. But I think we can all agree there are some object objective measures that we can establish to really determine if something is aesthetic or not. One of these measures is the pink aesthetic score developed by Dr. Forhauser. And the idea of this score is it has seven different variables that we can allocate a number to have a diff, uh, final score to determine if a restoration, a single implant restoration is an aesthetic restoration or not. So some of these variables that Dr. Forhauser um, chose for his pink aesthetic score is the contour, the alveolar process, the distal papilla, the level of the soft tissue, the mesial papilla, the soft tissue texture and the soft tissue color. So all of these aspects together, if we achieve a good aesthetic result, we will have each one of these variables with a high score. So let's take a look or let's apply this on a, an actual case. So when we look at this case, we can see there is definitely a problem with the final aesthetic result. But if we analyze the case a little bit more in depth, we can see that when we evaluate the tooth aspect of this um, case, the actual crown, we can see that the result is a pretty good result, in my opinion. You can see that the lab technician did an amazing job trying to map the color and the shade of the final restoration. But now let's take a look at the pink aspect of this case. And this is where we are seeing an actual problem where we're seeing that things are really not matching perfectly. So when we look back at the full case as a whole, we can see that this very small area in the um, cervical portion of the implant restoration is what really makes or break the case. 
this small different small little, little area is what's going to make the patient happy or unhappy about the final restoration so it could make a very big difference and the literature has shown us that the soft tissue is very very important when we ask patients how they feel about the color or the shape of the final restoration the majority of patients 88 percent are going to be either very satisfied or satisfied with the both the color and the shape of the final tooth however only 72 percent of the patients are between very satisfied or satisfied with the color and the shape of the soft tissue so that here we're starting to see a little bit of an issue how important is the soft tissue for that patient acceptance for the final restoration aesthetics. So the first thing for us to determine regarding the soft tissue will be the color. And for that, I want to sort of bring you back to those dental material classes that you got in dental school and bring you back to the different uh, coordinates of color. We have the L coordinates of color, which go to from white to black. We have the A coordinates of color that goes from green to red. And then we have the B coordinate that goes from yellow to blue. So when we are establishing the difference in color between two different entities, we're going to get a delta E. And that delta E is composed by the three different coordinates, the L, the A, and the B. The difference in color between the, these different coordinates are going to create that delta E. So when we evaluate uh, the color of a crown in, on a patient. So I, we recently delivered a crown and we want to evaluate the difference of, of color. If we see there is a difference of color between the crown and the tooth, most likely the delta E is going to be higher than 3.7. The threshold when for us to see a, a clinical difference in color between a restoration and a natural tooth is going to be 3.7. Anything below 3.7, we're not going to be able to see there is an actual difference in color. We're going to think that the match is very close. When we're talking about soft tissue, when we evaluate that pre-implant mucosa and compare it to the adjacent gingiva, that difference in color is much less. It's 3.1, the delta E. So it's a little bit less forgiving than when we're talking about the tooth. Now, we know, and the literature has reported this in um, extensive uh, papers that the color of the soft tissue around titanium implants is never the same that the color of the adjacent gingiva, mostly in the B and the L coordinates of color, meaning that the peri-implant mucosa is going to look a little bit darker and a little bit more bluish. So that's sort of like that grayish effect that we see with the soft tissue, uh, peri-implant soft tissue mucosa. In the majority of cases, there is not going to be a real um, a matching of color between the peri-implant mucosa and the adjacent gingiva. Actually, the literature has reported that only 37% of the cases, there is a real perfect match between the two of them. So it's really a very small number of cases. Some even report that no matter what type of restorative material we're going to put in there, there is not going to be a perfect match between the peri-implant mucosa and the attached gingiva. So it's something for us to be concerned. And a lot of that has to do because of the vascularization of the tissue. We know that the peri-implant mucosa has less, a smaller amount of blood vessels compared to the attached gingiva. So that's one aspect to, to, to consider. And we also know that the color of the soft tissue is based not only on the keratinization of the soft tissue, but also with the amount and the distribution of the blood vessels. So that will make a big difference. Now, how we can achieve implant aesthetics? First, let's discuss some aspects that are basically out of our control, that we cannot really do much about them. The first one will be the soft tissue biotype. We know that we can determine the tissue biotype by placing a probe into the sotos. If we see the probe shining through, it's going to be a thin tissue biotype. If not, it's going to be a thick tissue biotype. So evaluating the tissue biotype in a case like this, for example, that we really can see the probe shining through, 
it's going to give us a better idea or a better understanding of what we can achieve later on. Can we really mask the material that we're going to put under that soft tissue in a case like this? So something to be considered. Here, there is the same case. We are just placing a piece of paper, white to mimic zirconia, black to mimic metal or, or titanium. And you can see that even the zirconia, you can see a difference in the soft tissue color because the tissue is so thin that it cannot mask whatever we put underneath. Even more, the thin tissue biotype will be more prone to recession. There has been reported in the literature that we are going to see more recession with the thin tissue biotype. Another aspect that we cannot control is the amount of available bone. So when we're talking about the level of the mesial and distal papilla, we know that that interproximal bone is going to be the key for us to maintain the level of that papilla. When we're talking about the mid vocal area, there is now more factors. It's not only the amount of bone available, but it's also the tissue biotype and how we position that implant. The implant annulation and the depth of that implant is going to make a big difference for us to determine that facial margin. The next aspect about the available bone will be basically the buccal lingual contour of um, the bone and again the soft tissue. So we very commonly see this. This is a case you can see number nine is to be extracted. You can see in the occlusal view um, how much soft tissue we have. And then after the implant is placed and after the tissue heals, it's very commonly that we see this sort of concavity, this collapse of that buccal bone. So that is definitely a challenge. It's, it will be one of the variables um, that we see in the pink aesthetic score that we are not achieving in this case. We are achieving the level of the papilla, we're achieving the texture of the soft tissue. However, we're not achieving that alveolar process. We're seeing a collapse. What aspects we can control that we can try to make better for our final restoration? We can control the implant position, we can control the implant angulation, and we can control, control to some extent the soft tissue architecture. So I'm going to go in detail a little bit one of, the, of each of these. The first one will be the implant position. So we want the implant to be positioned in a way that will allow us to have enough emergence profile or a good running room to create a good emergence profile in a smooth way. We don't want to have any sort of sharp angles. We want to really create that emergence profile in a way that it's going to really support the tissue. So that subgingival contour is going to be very, very important for us to get a good aesthetic result. Usually, a good guideline will be if we draw an imaginary line joining the CJ of the adjacent teeth, we want the implant to be placed at least three millimeters below that CJ. That will be the sort of a guideline for us for implant placement. When we talk about implant angulation, uh, we want to be very careful how that implant is going to be angulated, not only the buccal lingual position, but how is that angulation, especially in these cases that we are doing an immediate implant placement. So in this case, you can see how the tooth is sort of like buccally inclined at the apical aspect. If we follow the same angulation that this tooth presents after we extract and do an immediate implant placement, this will be the result. And we know that this is not going to be a successful um, implant long term. We know this is a case that the tissue is going to end up collapsing. We're going to see a lot of discoloration. We're going to see a lot of bone loss. And this is a case that it's going to need major work later on. It's going to need grafting. It's going to need a additional surgery. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to manage this case. We know that implants that are placed too buccal are going to create up to three more times the triple the recession that we will see in implants that are properly placed. So placing the, the angulation of the implant is going to be very, very important to try to maintain those soft tissues. So that will be for the surgical aspect of it, what the surgeon can do to try to get a good result. But as restorative de dentists, we have some control on the soft tissue architecture, and that's the part that I want to share with you. 
a lot of it, and for me, is the key for success is to have a good provisional restoration that it's really going to shape the tissues and really help our, our tissues to develop. The provisional will help us do a number of things, will help us determine the gingival height, the contour, it help us determine that emergence profile, that contact point. It really sort of shows us the map for us to get to a good final restoration um, regarding the soft tissue. The literature has shown us that when we place an immediate implant and then place an immediate provisional at the same time, we can see up to one millimeter less soft tissue loss at the mid vocal area. So placing an immediate provisional really makes a big uh, difference on those immediate cases. Our implant provisional has to be, of course, really well shaped with that um, um, smooth uh, subgingival emergence profile, subgingival contours, really polished surface to allow for that soft tissue to really heal in the right way. For us to be able to place an implant and a provisional at the same time, we want to get a good primary stability. It's a little bit um, confusing in the literature. Some people think that 20, anything above 25 newton centimeters is enough for us to load the implant. Some people feel a little bit more comfortable with 30 newton centimeters. That will be sort of anything above 30 newton centimeters for primary stability will be the ideal value that we want to achieve for us to be able to load the implant immediately. But what do we do if we cannot achieve that primary stability? We already know that placing an implant provisional at the time of implant placement will help us maintain tissue with those immediate cases. What can we do if we don't have primary stability? Well, one thing that we can do is basically section that coronal portion and fabricate it, fabricating a um, customized healing abutment that we see here. The idea of the customized healing abutment is basically maintaining the soft tissue play support in place. It's basically maintaining that emergence profile, the same idea of the provisional, we're just not having that coronal aspect to avoid any excessive loading to the implant. So let me show you a case. This patient came, central incisor was hopeless. At this time, we decided to do an immediate implant placement. We did the extraction in a flapless approach to try to maintain the soft tissue as much as possible. And we placed the implant against the palatal bone to try to obtain as much stability as we could. However, at this time, we didn't find that there was enough primary stability. We didn't feel comfortable uh, for, to, to load this implant because the primary stability was not enough. So what we did is we did this customized healing abutment. Here is the occlusal view. Here is the frontal view. And this is just at the moment right after the surgery is finished. You can see that that healing abutment help us not only to maintain the soft tissue in place, but also is maintaining or stabilizing the, the blood clot. It's really a very clean procedure. And this is how the patient heal after three months. So here we can see that we are basically preserving what the patient had. We're not sort of, it sort of removes that question mark. Should we push the tissue more? Should we put more pressure? Should we remove a little bit more? It's basically just preserving what the patient came with, what nature gave us. So it's going to be a little bit easier for us to get the right contours for the final restoration. Even more, the importance of doing that provisional, um, it's shown in this study. I want to share with you this study that we did together with Dr. Monjir Bakshi and Dr. Tarnow. Um, this was a pilot study with only 10 patients. We didn't do any grafting. The patients came with hopeless teeth. Um, these patients were not having any implant restoration due to financial limitations. So we didn't do any grafting on that socket. We basically just placed a fixed ovate pontic that was entering into the socket three millimeters. It was a very smooth polish ovate pontic. Um, and then we evaluated the soft tissue uh, collapse three months after the extraction by doing an alginate impression and digitalizing that impression. So the patients that were going to have a removable partial denture as the final restoration, because we didn't want to prepare 
the adjacent deed, we want to keep them um, intact. In those cases, we did a Maryland uh, temporary fixed partial denture or a bonded bridge uh, with an ovate pontic that you can see it's extending three millimeters here in the apical part. In the patients that were having a fixed partial denture as the final restoration, we did prepare the deed since these patients were going to have uh, a fixed partial denture as the final restoration. The same idea, we had the ovate pontic three millimeters into the socket. So what does the literature tell us about the amount of bone that, or amount of tissue loss when we do an extraction and we do nothing else? We don't do any grafting, we don't do any additional procedures. So regarding the buccal lingual dimensions, when we do an, a tooth extraction, we're gonna see three to five millimeters on average if we do the extraction and no grafting, nothing else. Regarding the height, we're going to see one to four millimeters of bone loss. With the ovate pontic, just by placing that ovate pontic inside the socket and maintaining the soft tissue architecture, we're going to see only less than one millimeter of buccal lingual collapse, and we're going to see only 1.6 millimeters of height reduction. So that ovate pontic really helped us maintain the soft tissue in place to allow for healing of the bone underneath and really maintain the soft tissue stable. When we're talking about immediate implant studies, when we're talking about vertical changes, it's very hard to compare what's in the literature. Here is some example of some of the reports that, it, that we see in the literature. Some of them, they open the flap, some of them are flapless, some of them put a provisional, some of them do re-entry. So it's very difficult for us to really establish a true connection between all the studies. However, we do see an average 0.7 millimeters of vertical changes. When we're talking about horizontal changes, we're seeing about a one millimeter average of vocal lingual collapse in the majority of the studies, the majority up to six months of follow-up. Now, let's talk about the what of implant aesthetics. Let's talk about what type of restorative material we can use to get an aesthetic result. There is plenty of um, reports in the literature how having a, an implant will affect the color of the peri-implant soft tissue. It will create that grayish shadow um, on the peri-implant soft tissue. So it's something that is definitely there and we know it happens. So one solution that we have is in zirconia for our abutments that will help the color of the soft tissue. Well, if we really analyze what's in the literature, as with anything that is out in the dental literature, we're going to be able to find positive and negative results. There are some positive results using zirconia as abutment material, and they evaluated that they did provide a closer match of the perimplant mucosa to the adjacent gingiva. However, some other studies reported that no matter what material we're using, zirconia specifically is not giving the great um, a great result is still produce some discoloration on the gingiva. And this is based really by the, the findings on this study by Young and their group. This is an in vitro study. They use a peak job to evaluate how different thickness of soft tissue will mask different materials, um, or different restorative materials such as titanium, titanium layer with porcelain, zirconia, or zirconia layer with porcelain. And what they find out was that definitely titanium was the, diff the most difficult material to mask. It did cause difference in colors in most of the cases. However, for us to be able to mask whatever material we're going to put in there, we need three millimeters of soft tissue thickness to really mask the material. 1.5 millimeters in some cases cause discernible clinical differences. So really the key is going to be that mucosal thickness. The more the thicker the thicker the mucosa, the more we are going to be able to mask any material that we're going to put underneath. So based on the literature, it could be 1.5 millimeters to up to 3 millimeters for us to be really able to mask the soft tissue. So now we're starting to see sort of a pattern, how the thickness of that soft tissue is going to make a big, big difference on our final aesthetic result. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit more about another possibility of restorative material, which is the use of pink implants and pink abutments. Now, you may be thinking, because I did, why pink? Why, why are we going to use a pink abutment and a pink implant? You may think that maybe we want to be cute about it and they want to make a good looking implant. But basically the reason why we're doing pink is based on the study by Dr. Nagai in Harvard and, and her group. What they did is they put strips of paper of different colors into the sulcus and they evaluated the color of the soft tissue right here in the peri implant, in, in what would be the peri implant because in this case was uh, the attached gingiva. They evaluated the color with the different color papers using a spectrophotometer. And the result see, is, is um, basically what tells you why pink. You can see that the control is basically at the center of both graphs. Control means there was no paper at all to be used um, in between the sulcus and the tooth. It's just the natural tooth. And then you can see how the light pink was the, really the closer match between the, the natural tooth and having a material in there. Not the white, which will mimic zirconia, not the yellow, which will be gold. It's basically the light pink that gave us the closer match between a restorative pink material and an adjacent natural tooth. The way that the pink is obtained is basically an anodization process, meaning uh, creating a titanium oxide layer. It's part of the same titanium that looks pink to the eye. So that's basically how the implants look pink. So I want to share with you a study that we did together with Harvard University. This is all the people involved in the study. I actually, um, Dr. Nagai was the principal investigator in Harvard. Um, but basically all this group of people um, was a, an important part of the study. And I'm very happy and very proud to have shared a study with such a good group of people. It was a randomized multicenter clinical trial, two centers, Columbia University and Harvard University. Um, we enrolled 40 subjects, 20 on each side. We enrolled patients that had hopeless teeth on the maxilla from premolar to premolar that needed an immediate implant. Those patients were either randomized to pink or gray. I'll explain a little bit later. We didn't do any type of graft on our immediate implants. We did either immediate loading with an immediate provisional or we did a customized healing abutment as I just discussed. Then we did a final restoration that was delivered first with a gray custom abutment and later on with a pink custom abutment. Then we follow up for six months after delivery. So let me walk you through a case so you can see what we did on all of our cases. So this patient came with number nine a tooth that was determined to be hopeless. The patient was interested on an implant, so at this time we decided to do an immediate implant placement. The first thing that we did is we did a probing depth. We evaluated the probing depth on the buckle of this tooth. If the probing depth of, on the mid buckle was three millimeters or less, we assumed that the buckle plate of bone was present. If the buckle plate, if the probing depth was more than three millimeters, we inferred that maybe that buccal plate had some defect. So those patients were not included in the study. We wanted patients that had an intact, intact buccal plate of bone. Then uh, we did a, a CBCT scan to evaluate further the amount of bone present to evaluate if the case was really a good case for us to do an immediate implant placement. Then we decided and we, we proceeded with the, if the patient was um, had all the variables, um, meaning he met all the inclusion criteria, meaning the probing depth was less than three millimeter. We had good CT scan. We didn't have any health issues. Then we proceeded to doing the surgery. In this case, we did it a uh, flapless extraction. We wanted to preserve that soft tissue as much as possible. Uh, at, and at this time, the patient was randomized either to gray or the pink group. 
the Gray Group will have a traditional implant, which in this case was the Prima Conex implant by Keystone. And the Pink Group had the Pink Neck implant, which is the Genesis implant, also by Keystone Dental. So the implant was placed against the palatal bone to try to obtain a little bit more of primary stability. In this specific case, we were not able to obtain a good primary stability. It was less than 25 newton centimeters, so we didn't feel comfortable doing a, an implant crown in this case. So we wanted to do um, an implant provisional crown in this case. We didn't want to load it. So in this case, we did a customized healing abutment as you see in the picture, to just maintain the soft tissue as I discussed before. And as final restoration or as provisional restoration, sorry, um, the patient left with this bonded Maryland bridge. Uh, in this case, we use the patient existing ground to be a better shade matching for the color while the implant was healing. After the implant healed, we were able to load the implant with an implant provisional. We were able to finalize the shape of the tissue, the contour. Once the tissue was mature, three months after implant placement, we started with the final restoration. So we fabricated two identical titanium CAD CAM abutments, as you see in the picture. The first one was gray, was delivered first, with a zirconia crown that was cement retained. At this point, the patient left came back three, three weeks after for us to evaluate the soft tissue color. We wanted to allow the three weeks for the soft tissue to heal, for the soft, soft tissue not to be irritated with the change from the provisional crown to the final crown. We wanted to make sure that that tissue was the, the mature way so we could take a color that is going to be a little bit more objective and not do the color measurement with irritated tissue. At this time, at the three-week appointment where we measured the color with the gray abutment, we changed the abutment from gray to pink. It's the same identical abutment that we used first. The only difference is this abutment was anodized to appear like pink, as the same as is done with the implant neck. And then we cemented the same zirconia crown. The patient again went home, came back three weeks after, so we evaluate the color of the pink abutment. Again, letting the, the patient heal and the soft tissue heal at this appointment. So what are the variables that we evaluated in the study? The first, first variable that we evaluated is color. We saw some cases that there was a clinical difference in color between the pink abutment and the gray abutment. So let me show you some cases. This was the gray abutment when once it's delivered with the zirconia crown and here you can see the pink abutment with the zirconia crown as well you can see that with the pink abutment it appears that the soft tissue is a little bit lighter it's blending a little bit better with the, at the adjacent gingiva another case this is the gray uh, abutment you can see how the soft tissue look and here you can see how with the pink abutment, again, it appears to be a little bit lighter, blends a little bit better. Last case, this is with gray abutment. And then with the pink abutment, you can see it's a little bit nicer blend. Now, there were some cases that we saw no major different clinical uh, difference in color. Here you can see with the gray abutment. And here you can see with the pink abutment. In this case, it's hard to argue that it, you can see a major change between one or the other. This other case already had some melanotic pigmentation, so it made it a little bit harder for us to see if there was a difference in color. Now, you should probably be thinking, well, this is really not objective, right? You can tell me there was a difference in color, but I may see it, I may not see it. It's a little bit different, difficult to really come to an object, objective conclusion. And this is the right way of thinking because we want to have something objective to really compare the color between one aspect or the other. So we used the spectrophotometer that really gave us a value for us to really establish what a number for us to compare between one and one aspect to the other. So the first thing that we compared, um, which is our first publication, 
we compare the color of the soft tissue when we use gray abutments with the color of the soft tissue when we use pink abutments. And we measure in three different aspects, as you see in the picture. We measure at the incisal, middle, and cervical. It's called this way because that's the way the spectrophotometer is designed. It's made to be used for teeth and not for soft tissue. However, we use the same names for uh, adjusted on uh, as you see in the in the picture. So those patients that were randomized to gray implants, we um, when we changed the abutment from a gray abutment to pink abutment on this group, we saw that in the A aspect of color, that if you remember, is the, the A coordinate goes from yellow to red, from, sorry, goes from red to green. In the A aspect of color, we saw on the patients that have gray implants, we saw a significant change, making the perimental mucosa look significantly more red compared to a, with the pink abutments compared to the gray abutments. So it's, it was a little bit uh, the blending of the of the soft tissue was a little bit better. When we changed to the other group, to the group that had the pink implants, the pink neck implants, the genesis, what we saw is also there was a significant difference in the A aspect of color, but here not only at the cervical aspect, but also at the middle aspect. So the mucosa appeared more pink, similar to that of adjacent gingiva. Then we decided to move for, for further. We didn't want to just measure, okay, the difference between pink and gray within the same tooth. We want to compare the pink and the gray with the adjacent gingiva. So this is our second public publication. So when we compare the soft tissue color of the implant and the adjacent gingiva in the two different groups, using the pink implants or the gray implants, we did see a smaller um, delta L, A, and B on the pre-implant uh, tissue color when we use pink, implant, pink implants. However, this was not statistically significant. So the pink implant did help a little bit, but it wasn't to the level that it created a statistical significant result. But when we changed that abutment from gray to pink, that creates a, a statistical significant difference in color, more specifically in the A aspect of color. So that means that that um, peri-implant mucosa was looking much more similar to the peri-implant, to, to the adjacent gingiva, specifically in the, gre the green-red aspect of color. So just changing the abutment make a better result um, for our final restoration. Then we went forward and we started introducing different variables. So the first variable that we wanted to introduce was the tissue biotype. So again, to evaluate the tissue biotype, we can do it with periodontal probes like I discussed before. However, there is still a little bit of subjectivity to it. You can say that you can see the probe through the tissue. I can say that I cannot see it. It's a little bit more subjective. So we wanted to have a more objective way of evaluating the tissue to determine if the tissue was thin or thick. So let me show you this first case. This was a, a thick tissue biotype. I'll show you why it was a thick tissue biotype. The first thing that we did is we put strips of paper inside the sulcus, either white or black. And we measured the soft tissue color with the white paper in place and with the black paper in place to evaluate if there was really a difference in color between the two of them. And we see here the one, the square that it's highlighted that you can see here in the right and here in the left is actually the body measurement, which, which show us a delta E of 2.9. It's high, but you will see how that delta E is with thin patients and how we determine how a patient was a thin tissue biotype based on that. So on the same patient with the thick tissue biotype, once we determined it was a thick tissue biotype, we evaluated the soft tissue color with a pink abutment that you see in the picture on the left, and on the, a gray abutment that you see in the picture on the left, and a pink abutment that you see in the picture on the right. And when we compare the color of the two of them, we see that the delta E between the two of them 
is very low. It's only 1.4. That means that it's not really discernible at a clinical level. This is the case that if I show you the gray on the left and the pink on the right, you may not be able to tell much of a difference if putting a pink about when it's going to make a major difference in this case or not. So it makes a little, it, it doesn't make as big as a, as a difference. Now let's take a look at a thin tissue biotype case. So you can see here the probe, you can see it through, but again, we want it to be more, more objective. So we place the papers the same way that we did with the thick tissue biotype. And here you can really see how that paper discolors the soft tissue. So we did the same measurements. And when we do the measurement, take a look at the body measurement, which is exactly here at the center of the soft tissue. The body measurement is now a delta E of nine, which is a might, much higher uh, number that we saw with the thick tissue biotype, which was two. So this tells us that this case is a thin tissue biotype. So in this case, when we de determine the difference between the gray abutment and the pink abutment that you see in, in the screen, we're going to see a delta E that is higher than what we saw with the thin tissue biotype that was in the one level. So this is the case where here is with the gray abutment, here is with the pink abutment. And here is the case where you see really a difference between the two, the two abutments. If you do a close-up, you can really see that with the pink abutment, you are really seeing the tissue with a much lighter color. It's a much better blend with the soft tissues. So then we, did, we went ahead and really compared the soft tissue thickness with the final color compared to the adjacent gingiva. So what we saw is when we compare patients that had a thin tissue biotype with a, when we changed the gray abutment to a pink abutment, we got a significantly much lower number on the A coordinate of color, meaning changing the abutment from gray to pink on a thin tissue biotype really helped blend that soft tissue better in the red aspect of color, meaning it looked a little bit more red. So it helped much more with the thin tissue biotype, irregardless of what type of implant we were using. With the thick tissue biotype, it didn't make much more of a difference changing from a gray abutment to a pink abutment because the tissue was masking a little bit more that material that were, we were using. Then we went ahead and we started evaluating different aspects on our patients on the study. So the first aspect that we evaluated was the rich the dimensional change. We wanted to see how much tissue collapse we were seeing on these patients. So we have this patient, this is the preoperative pre view. We discussed this before, how we normally see that a soft tissue collapse after that implant is placed. We see sort of like this small area right here where the tissue uh, in some cases, we see that concavity of the tissue that, that is due to the tissue collapse. So we wanted to evaluate or to numerically uh, assess how much was that collapse. So for that, we did alternate impressions before the tooth was extracted and six months after the crown was delivered. And using digital dentistry, we were able to superimpose both casts and we were able to evaluate how much that collapse was there. So imagine if I just cut, do a cut here, a sagittal cut, this is what we will see here. This is a sagittal cut of the superimposition of the two casts. So pointed with the red, with the green arrow, we're going to see the outline of the preoperative um, cast. And then with the red arrow, we're going to see the outline of the six month follow up post operative cast. What we saw is, irregardless of the type of groups, gray, pink, thin, thick, we saw an average of 0 0.7 millimeters of collapse, which is a little bit less than what we see in the literature. In the literature, we, we see reported up to one millimeter of buccal lingual collapse at six months. In our case, it was a little bit less. 
Then we went ahead and evaluated the CBCT scans. That was another variable that we wanted to assess. So our patients received a CBCT scan before the implant was placed to evaluate the amount of bone that had present. And then they got a second CBCT scan six months after the restoration was delivered. We use a digital software to try to um, align the preoperative to the postoperative scan at the same level. So when we did the sectioning, it was really the same thing that we were watching, irrespective of the patient's head position at the time of the CBCT scan. So the first thing that we used is an, an anatomic landmark. Um, and then we draw a vertical line, which you can see with the yellow line in the pre-op and post-op scan. We use that landmark to sort of use it as a, the center of the alveolus or the center of the tooth to sort of section into. And then we were able to very accurately do measurements at the same level at the crest of the ridge and three millimeters below the crest of the ridge by using the measurements of that vertical line to be almost the same. So that tells us that we were really measuring at the same level at the crest and three millimeters of gingival. The last variable that we evaluated was the implant position. We did a horizontal measurement, meaning how much was that buccal lingual distance between the implant and the soft tissue. And then the vertical measure, measurement, how much was the distance between the implant platform to the soft tissue in a vertical aspect. So what we wanted to do is sort of like correlate all these different variables. We have the tissue biotype, we have the implant position, we have the CBCT scans, and we have the measurements that we did in the cast. So we wanted to see how any of these can associate to each other. The first thing that we wanted to evaluate is how the tissue a biotype or tissue phenotype really um, correlate to the rich dimension, meaning the measurement that we did either in the cast or in the CBCT scan. What we saw is that there was no correlation. No matter how much uh, patients have had thin tissue biotype or thick tissue biotype, the average was very similar, which was 0 0.7 millimeters, as I, I mentioned before, of buccal lingual collapse. However, the tissue biotype did have a, a positive correlation with recession. We saw that patients that have a thin tissue biotype had much more recession, up to two millimeters almost, versus the thick tissue biotype that had 1.2 millimeters. So definitely having a thin tissue biotype, as reported by Evans, um, makes a big difference on the amount of recession that we're going to see. Now, regarding the horizontal implant position, when we correlate that to the tissue collapse, there was a correlation. When we correlate it to the measurement that we did in the cast, which basically is the measurement of the soft tissue, the, the first three to four millimeters, we saw that the more the horizontal implant position, the more the collapse we were seeing. When we were correlating the implant position to the CBCT scan measurement, we saw that the more the horizontal implant position, the less we saw bone changing in the CBCT scan. So this could be because the measurements were done in really two different areas. With the CBCT scan, we were measuring at the bone crest, which is usually is three millimeters below the soft tissue. With the tissue collapse, we were measuring the cast one to three millimeters below the crest of the margin. So we are still measuring at the level, level of the tissue. So placing the implant more palatally will create a more collapse of the soft tissue, but maybe it will help us um, produce the same amount of bone. Now, the results on this horizontal implant position, we have to evaluate a little bit further. One of the limitations we have is that we really didn't place any bone graft material between our implant and our, and our socket. And we know by the, so, the studies by Dr. Chu, Dr. Tarnow, Dr. Amato, that this could be an issue. Um, we know that we could see more collapse in those cases that we are not placing a bone graft. So it's a limitation that we have. 
The other limitation that we have is that our restorations were cement retained and not screw retained. So it was a little bit maybe more difficult to, to shape the tissues. However, we try to compensate on that by doing the provisional restorations or the customized healing abutment with everything that I discussed before to try to maintain that tissue in place and try to stabilize that tissue in place. So really the color aspect with using pink implants and pink abutments could be a more significant in patients that have thin biotype. This could be potentially another tool that we have in our pockets to use in those more cases that we may need a little bit extra aid. We may be able, if we do our um, evaluation preoperatively, to evaluate what type of tissue, what type of smile line the patient has, this could be a potential tool that could help us get a good result. So with that, I want to thank everybody for your attention and I want to move to any questions that the audience may have. So I may, I'm going to start going through each of these questions. Okay, so um, there is a question here asking if um, utilizing the pink implants will be a way to differentiate the practice. Um, I would say yes. I think that, um, like, I, like I mentioned before, is a tool that we can have in those cases that we may be concerned, high smile line, thin tissue biotype, that could create um, maybe an issue um to to some patients having the pink implants may be a good tool for us to have um, then there is a question if using the pink implant and using the pink abutment help with a better soft tissue attachment um, not necessarily with the pink abutment itself um, the Genesis implants do, do have a um, hydrophilic surface, so they will attract blood and it will help for bone formation regarding the tissue. Um, we know that the smaller and cleaner the surface, the better the tissue will attach to that prosthesis that we have. So we want to have um, this as smooth surface as possible. We want to make sure that there is no, if there is glaze, it's very polished, the surface that we have in there. If it's titanium, it's polished, if we don't scratch. So digital to try to keep that tissue as healthy as possible. Um, then there is a question, if you do graft, which material I prefer? Um, and which would be the graft that is logically attached to the implant? So, um, I do the prosthetic part. I don't do the surgical part. I leave that to the surgeons. I work with um, great uh, oral surgeons and periodontists. Um, as far as I understand, there is not actually a true attachment between the graft and the implant. There's always going to be some soft tissue connection. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that much uh, on that question, I would sort of refer that, defer that to the uh, oral surgeons and periodontists. Um, there is a question if Keystone provides the pink abutment um, only with Genesis or Dialog or, or Restore. Um, I believe that they are, um, they provide it with any implant, I think. Um, it's a matter of you checking with your local rep and they will be able to tell you how to, to manage that part. I'm trying to see if there is any more questions. Okay, so if there is no additional questions, um, I will end it here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for joining me. I wish everybody a good and um, a great Memorial Day uh, long weekend. And oh, there is one more question actually, sorry. Um, 
So the question is, if you use these implants, did you see an increased patient experience due to the implant looking more aesthetic than with the pink color? So we did ask the patients if they prefer one over the other, and some patients did want it uh, to, to we, give, we gave them the option after the study was done if they wanted the pink abutment or the gray abutment. And they did want it to, to have the pink abutment as the final restoration. And since we had both, we just changed it for some of these patients. So um, some of these patients did want to have that pink abutment. So that, that may give you a little bit of an indication um, how your patients may want. Um, if the implant is analyzed, does it change the surface of the implant? Um, as it relates to soft tissue, uh, not necessarily. Um, as it relates to the bone, um, yes, because um, you want the bone to attach to the implant. So that's why you see the pink part only at the neck of the implant and not in the body. The body has a different surface to try to attract the bone cells a little bit better. Um, but doesn't mean that it's not going to be attracted to, to the analyzation process. It's a very com it's basically a, a new a, a different color of titanium oxide, but it's the same titanium oxide that we see in all of our implants. Um, I would say, it, can you make a custom pink abutment? There is a question, um, the, and the answer is uh, yes. Again. Um, we need to, you need to talk to your local rep, but these were customized um, pink abutments. They were CAD CAM custom abutments. So it's, um, it's possible. Um, the crowns that we use over the pink abutment were zirconia crowns with layer porcelain on the vocal to give a little bit more aesthetic. Um, then let me just read one or two more questions. Um, so there is a question, um, when an implant is positioned in the palatal aspect, the final restoration has to be projected to the vocal. This is a mini type of ridge lab, pontic shape. How does this affect the aesthetics? So by you doing that um, customized healing abutment or immediate provisional, um, that will um, maintain the support of the tissue. I don't find, I understand what you're saying about the rich lab. Um, most of the time, if you place the implant deep enough, you're going to have a good running room for your emergence profile that you're not going to have sort of like a, a horizontal rich lab. It's going to be more of a smooth type of emergence profile. So it should be um, a little bit easier. Um, I would say the last question now. Um, so there is a uh, there are two questions that I'm gonna sort of um, do it together. There is a question about using um, gold color abutments or using white abutments, and we did thought about doing um, the study with gold or with white. However, if you see the study by Dr. Nagai, when they put the paper colors inside the solvents and they evaluate with respect to photometer with different colors, they saw that the pink was actually the closest to the natural um, dentition. Maybe if we compare gold versus pink, or if we compare white versus pink, the results will be a little bit different, and that's part of a different study. Um, it's, it's something that it's still, something that we can um, evaluate and study because um, it may give us a different result, but again, I'm ex or uh, we can assume by Dr. Nagai's study that maybe pink will give us a closer match based on, on, on the results that she got. So I think that we, are, we have reached um, our time. I want to thank everybody for joining again and, and thank you Keystone for this experience and stay safe, stay well and have a great weekend everybody. Thank you.